Good. So um, thanks again for having me on. Uh, always a pleasure to um, talk to uh, BAs and uh, especially on this topic of devil's advocacy, uh, which is the subject today. And uh, before I start, I just want to give a little bit of a background on myself. Um, I am currently a consultant in uh, North Carolina, business consultant. As you can see from these bullet points here, I've had a variety of experiences over the years, uh, product and marketing management, uh, new product development and launch, business analysis and strategy. Uh, a lot of this has been, most of this has been in the medical device industry, primarily in what I call class two medical devices like the uh, vital signs monitor you see on the screen there. And some of the companies you may know, uh, Philips Healthcare, for example, or Laredo Medical. Um, I've worked for a variety of small companies also. And I'm uh, currently a mentor in what's called the NSFI Corps program. This is a government program that helps um, primarily academics get concepts commercialized, although it's now involved some other uh, small startups. And I've done instruction in um, uh, critical thinking, and I've written a book on devil's uh, advocacy. As you can see in the in my background, I've had a variety of uh, training and certificates um, along the way, uh, Prince to practitioner, business analytics, and other certificates. But what you don't see on there is any reference to the business analyst title. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, why am I addressing this group today? Why am I addressing business analyst if I've never had that official title. And you'll recall that according to the IBA, a uh, business analyst is any person who performs business analysis, doesn't matter what their job title or organizational role may be. And as you can see from the IBA uh, hub and spoke diagram on the right, that there are uh, all kinds of business analysts that uh, are out there, even though they don't have that title. And I've uh, indicated with those red circles, some of the roles that I've held along the way. So my perspective comes from uh, being a um, product manager, portfolio manager and the like, uh, but also someone who has done business analysis over the years. Today, I'm gonna to be focusing on um, three key topics. Uh, these are um, expanded in the book that I referred to earlier. Uh, that you see on the right hand side there. But the three uh, focus areas I'm going to be talking about today is the origin of devil's advocacy and how that led to modern devil's advocacy, uh, why we need to subject our formal processes and best practices to challenge analysis uh, like devil, uh, modern devil's advocacy, and how our daily practice of modern devil's advocacy uh, may help improve business analysis throughout an organization. Uh, I also believe that this practice can help us in our personal lives too, but the focus today will be more on the business aspects of uh, the practice. So just to give um, a very brief history of devil's advocacy, uh, early references can be found in the Catholic Church at the end of the 14th century. Um, the practice was institutionalized by the church a couple of hundred years afterwards. Uh, it was intended to control saint making by local parishes um, by way of a more uniform method of investigation uh, at the Vatican. Essentially, uh, the Pope decided that there were just too many parishes coming up with their own saints, and they had to get this under control. They had to have some means to know that the people who they were acknowledging had these saintly qualities actually had these qualities, right? So they did this by establishing a trial format where there was a prosecutor who had the official title of the promoter of the faith. And the role of this party was to argue against the case of someone who was being uh, offered up as a saintly person. But because the promoter of the faith, the prosecutor, was working against that person, uh, they were also called the devil's advocate. They were working on behalf of the devil, essentially. It's interesting to note that um, there have been changes. This, this was going on for many centuries, but there were changes uh, in the 1980s during the um, papacy of John Paul II. Uh, in 1983, there were revisions to the way that this process worked. And the role of the devil's advocate was essentially, if not eliminated, reduced substantially. And it so happened that after 1983, uh, John Paul II canonized more saints in his less than 30-year 
um, time as Pope than did all the popes from the previous 500 years combined. So I'm not saying the quality of canonization was reduced, but it is interesting that once this uh, devil's advocacy role was removed, where the person was being uh, prosecuted was challenging these individual candidates, there did seem to be a significant rise in the number of people who are making it through the canonization process. So that brings us to uh, what you might call modern devil's advocacy. Um, and what we see here is um, it's a definition from this book, Structured Analytic Techniques. Uh, these gentlemen who wrote this book are former CA intelligence analysts. So they've developed techniques, uh, they've had analyzed uh, tricky situations and they train other people how to do it. And they define it as a type of challenge analysis for critiquing a proposed judgment plan or decision. It's usually done by a single analyst who was not previously previously involved in the deliberations. So they're independent of those original deliberations. Um, the advocate is charged with challenging the proposed judgment by building the strongest possible case against it, much like the original uh, devil's advocates did. It's important to note that there's no prescribed procedure. This is not yet another formal process or best practice. It's really very open-ended. It's up to the devil's advocate to decide how they're going to uh, approach the case. And it's certainly not about playing. A lot of times when you read about this in the uh, popular press, they refer to it as playing devil's advocate. But uh, it's really not about playing. It's a serious method that, that can be used for judgment analysis. Characteristics of a good analytic thinker, according to um, the authors of that book I just showed you, which I believe were also good for a good devil's advocate, uh, are to challenge key assumptions, to consider alternative explanations of hypotheses, to look for inconsistent data that would justify discarding a hypothesis early, to focus on key drivers, which is really, you know, considering systems thinking about the way you're looking at problems, and to keep context in mind, which means how do you, how are you as the advocate going to best serve the client? And it has nothing to do with your age, your gender, your where you are in the org chart, just like. Um, Devil, just like a business analyst, anybody who engages in modern devil's advocacy is a modern devil's advocate. So at this point, you may be hearing what I'm saying about these different features and saying, well, look, you know, we business analysts, aren't we already modern devil's advocates? <clears throat> and I would say, well, you may be, um, but there's uh, several uh, key challenges that make this a difficult process. One of them is uh, this uh, popular idea of the uh, Dunning-Kruger effect, which you may have heard about. Uh, this was coined uh, by psychologist David Dunning and uh, Justin Kruger back in 1999. They identified it as a cognitive bias where we're unable to recognize our own incompetence. And not only do we not recognize that we're incompetent, but we think that we're much better at something than we actually are. And if you look at the graph on the right-hand side, you'll see this is a reproduction of their data there, the subjects were given a, a, t a test, there was a score in the test, and then they were asked how they thought they did. As you can see, people at the left um, were the poorest performers and people at the right were the highest. And people who didn't really have the competency thought they did much better than they did. And this worked its way all the way up through the different quartiles until you get to the most competent people on the right. And you notice there was a crossover which suggests that people who are very competent know that they don't know everything. And so they are suspicious of their own um, knowledge level. And that was an interesting twist. But an important reminder uh, that one of the researchers, David Dunning points out, is that the first rule of the Dunning-Kruger Club is that you don't know you're a member of the Dunning-Kruger Club. It affects everybody. All of us are affected by this. So if you take a look at um, how well do professionals actually uh, make judgments in the real world, you can find a variety of uh, troubling uh, surveys and reports. Uh, this is one that was reported by McKinsey and Company. Um, and what they did was they interviewed over 2,200 executives about their strategic decisions and uh, that their firms conducted. And what they found was that mergers routinely fail uh, to uh, deliver the expected synergies. The strategic plans often ignore competitive responses. The large investment projects are over budget time and again. 
and the cognitive biases affect the most important strategic decisions. And it doesn't matter how smart the people are or how well rated the company is. This is something that happens uh, regularly uh, that companies are constantly struggling to just make better decisions. So a question I have for the audience is, how many of you have worked at a company or are working at a company uh, that conducts annual training in critical thinking and decision-making? My own experience has been that this is very rare. Uh, generally, companies will do things like conduct fire drills, right? The city requires you to conduct fire drills and make sure you can get out of the building fast enough. Uh, companies typically have annual meetings where they're doing planning of some type. Uh, but when it comes down to actually ensuring that the uh, employees are getting uh, good critical thinking and decision-making skills, that doesn't seem to be something that's regularly conducted at many companies. So one of the questions that comes to mind when I consider this is, might there be poor pre-workforce training that continues to contribute to poor uh, professional decision-making skills? And there is some uh, evidence that this may be the case. Uh, here, for example, is the, um, an evaluation. It's called the CLA Plus. Uh, and this uh, attempts to uh, evaluate the decision-making of college-level students. As you can see from the graph on the right-hand side, um, there is a difference between freshmen and seniors, right? Uh, this, this test is not, not taking a look at subject area knowledge, but how well the students are on elements like critical thinking, analytical reasoning, and such. And so there is a difference between the freshman and senior classes. However, even the senior class who is leaving and going into the workforce, um, in this case, uh, indicated that 40% of the seniors were unable to distinguish the quality of evidence in building an argument. And in another unrelated survey of 400 companies, respondents rated um, recent college graduates 44% of them as uh, poorly or not at all prepared uh, with these critical judgment-making skills. So then a question I have for the audience is, how many of you attended a college that had a required course in critical thinking and decision-making? Again, from what I've seen and I've, I've uh, interacted with local colleges in the area, um, there generally aren't formal courses that are a requirement uh, in the education. And so I think what half, oftentimes happens is people, especially in the um, engineering and science areas, think, well, it's part of what we learned. It may not be called out as a separate course, but we, we know what we're doing. We're trained how to, to do these um, thinking and the analytical aspects. And so maybe if there was more of that kind of training, there'd be more uh, better critical thinking skills in the workforce. Well, Here's an example of a, another paper. This was published by uh, two instructors at the college level who are putting together a critical thinking course for engineering students at the collegiate level. And what they observed was that engineering and science training can actually discourage critical thinking skills. And this may seem counterintuitive, but it could be because students are presented with only well-established theories and best practices. Technical courses always provide positive evidence. And so the student is trained to expect such evidence in the problems that they're going to be solving. And the evidence is pre presented authoritatively. Students are told this is a fact. They're not required to uncover these facts through critical thinking skills. And taking a look at the diagram on the right, uh, this is sort of what happens in most science classes, right? Students show up, they're all given the same chemicals and beakers and Bunsen burners and the like. And they're told, follow this course of action and this is the outcome you will get. And if you don't get that outcome, no one's going to consider giving you a Nobel Prize because you've discovered something new. They're gonna tell you, 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 you made a mistake. You didn't follow the instructions properly. Or you mismeasured something because this prescriptive training tells you do these stepwise things to arrive at this positive end. So then this leads me to consider maybe this kind of prescriptive training transfers these potential pitfalls of not using critical thinking skills into other process-driven environments. So here's another paper. This is done on um, causal complexity and projects um, that was conducted where they looked at a variety of projects to see 
how well can you manage the cause and effect relationships as the complexity increases. And what they found was that these prescriptive paradigms emphasize process control. And in the cases, the goals are predetermined, the objectives are clear, the sequence of activities is pre-scheduled. Again, this sounds much like a science class, right? The, as opposed to teachers and uh, students, there's managers and stakeholders. The managers are accountable for any deviation. And these prescriptive diagrams, however, are lacking in certain projects that involve fuzzy mission and goals, objectives that are not clearly rooted in a fixed reality, and where solutions need time to emerge within complex and emergent social processes. And I think you may agree that many of the projects you're involved in, what appears to be the case when you first start turns out not to be the case. And as you're trying to solve this problem that you think you're trying to solve, there are other things happening in the background that might be changing the goalposts, right? So this same kind of prescriptive process that we see in, in our educational systems, stepwise learning, is uh, an attempt is made to use it in the workforce setting, and it may have equally uh, negative effects. So then the question I have is, can these prescriptive processes that we use in business analysis create a false sense of certitude and unrealistic expectations? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, this uh, slide is used to show an analogy by Annie Duke, uh, who is the author of a popular book called Thinking in Bets. Uh, Annie is a former successful poker player, and she's now a consultant to companies to try to help them understand, you know, how do you manage risk in a uh, in in the business world? And in her analogy, she compares the game of chess, which you see in the left, to the game of poker, which you see in the right. And in the game of chess, uh, it is very much skill based, right? All the pieces are on the board. Everybody can see what's on the board. Pieces don't magically disappear and then reappear later in the game. And so the winner of the game is very often going to be the person who has the highest skill because there's really not much luck involved in the game of chess. By comparison, the game of poker is, is chance-based. It's skill, but it's also chance-based. So the good poker players can sort of guess what the likelihood is that they're uh, the cards they're holding might win based on other things that they see, but they don't know the cards that the other players are holding. They don't know the next cards that are going to be thrown. And so their goal is not to come up with the right answer all the time. Rather, their goal is to come up with a reasonable bet that they have a good chance of winning a particular hand, but they don't want to lose everything. They want, don't want to find themselves in an all-in bet where they lose everything and then they can no longer play the game. And so they're really sort of um, balancing the uncertainty of the world that they're dealing in, um, in in order to make sure that overall uh, they're getting the best overall outcomes. So on the left, we see what I think is a good analogy for a prescriptive process. Uh, the way that we're taught as children, the way that we're trained as analysts and the like, is that if you follow these steps, it's reliably deterministic. Everything will turn out fine in the end. But what we're actually dealing with is a game of poker, which is uh, resistance uh, to prescriptive processes, where there's probabilities, where there's uncertainty, and where these prescriptive processes that we may learn and may have been trained in might not always be uh, very useful. So our real world challenge uh, looks something like this. Uh, we tend to be facing uh, a nonlinear systems environment, right? It includes a lot of issues, both technical and human factors. Uh, we can't know all of the elements of the entire system, right? It's just generally too big. And so based on what the particular problem is believed to be, uh, or based on time and resources, we tend to focus on just one area and that's represented by that narrow uh, gray cone of vision. And as a consequence of this, uh, our field of vision, what we're taking a look at, excludes a lot of elements, some that are critical, shown in red there. Uh, they might be out of our field of vision or they might be hidden by something else that we're looking at in the local uh, environment. So when we are approaching these kinds of problems, 
uh, we are processing the information with two different kinds of thinking, so-called system one thinking and system two thinking. Uh, system one thinking is kind of the automatic reflexive thinking that we have. It's when you see something and you come to a quick conclusion about it. The system two thinking is deliberative. It's the rational thinking you do when you try to calculate something or when you use one of the various processes or best practices uh, that you may have been trained in. But in either case, in both cases, I should say, of system one and system two thinking, it's going through our brain, of course, uh, which is uh, distorted by our own bias and fallacy. And I list here some of the more popular, or I should say impactful bias and fallacy that I think we run into. Um, there was by one account, something in excess of 225 uh, different forms of bias and fallacy that affect us in our judgment making. But these kinds of ones that I put in the top, these tend to be um, pretty common. Uh, from my experience. So for example, confirmation bias, where uh, you tend to accept information that supports what you already believe, and you tend to easily dismiss anything that goes against the way that you uh, believe. Or survivorship bias, where because over the course of uh, many uh, past instances, you see certain successes, and so you assume that everything will go in that direction. And that's because you don't know all of the failures uh, that were achieved under the same conditions, right? So again, it gets back to this idea about how strong or how useful is a prescriptive process or best practice at any given time. So in the real world challenge, what we end up doing is we're facing a very complex system uh, with a somewhat narrow view, generally time constrained and resources constrained and process it into a very simplified model that we and our associates can manage. And oftentimes this complex system is reduced into a simple cause and effect relationships, which may or may not exist. Uh, there, we may not have enough time to actually know with certitude that this particular facet over here is changing something over here. However, we may have very high confidence uh, based on the fact that we're using processes, best practices, mental models, and the like. And so um, our experience, our bias, our belief, all of these things interact to give us a sense of certitude that we have very high confidence that things are gonna turn out just fine when in fact they may not. And here's where devil's advocacy, I think, uh, can be a particularly powerful tool to use. So the devil's advocate, uh, again, bringing in this party who is an independent resource, who's not gonna look at the problem the same way as you, they're gonna be taking a different view. They're gonna be looking not only what you're looking at, but they may be opening the vision a little bit more to include some things that you may not have been able to see yourself. And then with this information, they're gonna take a look at the, um, the output that you've generated, the uh, cause and effect relationships, the hypotheses, the assumptions and the like that you've made. And they're going to be challenging what your judgment was. So um, it's, it's an independent perspective to sort of push you a little bit off balance to see if you um, really have thought through this thing, if there's other another interpretation of what you're looking at. Now, it's important to remember that the devil's advocate is also human. Devil's advocate will have their own biases and they will come, they'll make fallacious um, uh, decisions themselves. Uh, the point, however, is not to come up with the one right decision. Uh, just like any uh, business analyst, your, your role isn't really to say, here's what you ought to be doing. It's really as devil's advocate to say, is this really, does this really make sense? You know, you're, you're making this assumption here What's the evidence for that assumption? You know, you've made this judgment here. Why do you believe that? And so that's the, the real role of the devil's advocate and what the process brings to any kind of a judgment that's been made. The other thing, um, I think this gets back to the very first uh, diagram, one of the early diagrams, is if you take a look, step back and take a look at the network of folks that you're working with, this fellow business analysts, throughout an organization, um, there's an opportunity here to start working more closely with people who have a like-minded um, uh, usefulness in this challenge analysis. So the more people that you can bring together, 
to have this sort of skeptical, informed skeptical perspective about challenging judgment in the organization, I feel the better the opportunity for judgments to be challenged on a more regular basis. Um, it doesn't have to be a formal thing. I'm not suggesting that people should suddenly start to call themselves devil's advocates or, or refer to other people as such. But there's an opportunity to find people within the organization who may not be official business analysts, but who have strong analytical skills and to be able to say, look, you know, here's something I'd like you to take a look at, you know, tell me what the thoughts are and to do the same for them. And by doing that, to start to have this interconnected informal web that you see uh, that gives the organization a better way to take a look at the decisions that are made, being made in a day-to-day -day basis. So there are some um, takeaway challenges that um, I'm proposing to you this morning. Uh, but the one is to practice the behaviors of a modern devil's uh, advocate uh, daily. And these include some things like curiosity and skepticism, uncertainty, um, self-critical, uh, open to diverse views, all those things I discussed earlier. To next demonstrate to others by example, the benefits of modern devil's advocacy. And I'm not recommending that anybody start preaching this in the organization, but to just you know show by example, to uh, bring up examples that you've witnessed others do and just say, you know, look, I think this was beneficial for the following reasons. And then lastly, to encourage others in uh, our networks to embrace the behaviors and daily practice of the modern devil's advocate, as I showed in that uh, prior slide, to try to form these informal networks where you can lean on people and, and ask them to sort of test judgments, uh, yours and other people's judgments within the organization. Um, there was quite a few. There were quite a few comments, uh, and it, I learned from them that people typically do not uh, get critical thinking courses in their college years, and also not in their professional life. Uh, so most people indeed don't have a formal training on this uh, topic of being a devil's advocate. Um, a question by Jan Willem, should a devil's advocate have a different background to prevent the same biases as the other people in the team? Yeah, this is a really interesting conundrum, right? Because uh, I, I point out in the book uh, as an example, if you're being brought in to do something very specific, let's suppose there's a new drug being developed and somebody wants to challenge the process that will be followed. Well, I certainly wouldn't be any help there. I don't understand drug delivery. But if you're in the business community, uh, I think it would be okay to have a similar background, although I always advocate the people try to broaden uh, their experience. I think we can all agree generally there's this T that they talk about. There are people who have deep knowledge, the experts in one field, and then there are people who have broad knowledge. And I think it's beneficial in devil's advocacy to have the broad knowledge. So you can say, oh, you know, I've seen this before. It's not in your industry, but I saw something like this in this other industry, and here's what they did for that. So I don't think it's I don't think it's uh, precludes you from being a devil's advocate, but I think it's helpful if you have broad experience. Okay, and another question by the Brazilian BA: uh, Could a trusted advisor play both the devil's and God's advocate role simultaneously? So it's like a bit of the connection or the tension between the two talks we have here? Yeah, and in fact, this is another interesting point, I think. Um, I in my book, I refer to um, authoritatively addressing authority, right? So the devil's advocate has to be trusted. People have to feel as though they're not being cynical and trying to stop things. And so you have to sort of present your material in a way that shows your client that you're, this is beneficial to you. You may not like to hear what I'm telling you, but this is beneficial. And so if the person, your client believes you and they trust you, that's clearly the best place to be. So I, I think the advocate has to be a trusted advisor too. I think ideally you want management to say, look, I want you to come over here. I know this is gonna be painful for people and you're gonna encounter a lot of flack maybe, but I, I need you to come over here and take a look at this because I value your opinion. Yeah. But I can imagine it takes a bit of time to build that trust and you can't be, let's say, the negative person all the time. 
Yeah, in fact, I know some people have pointed out that it, and, and some companies, they try to rotate the devil's advocate so they don't always see the same person coming into it. Uh, it's just that I, I advise people as, and do researchers. Researchers point out that if this is just done as theatrics, people are going to be very negative towards it. So whoever does this has to do it honestly. They have to be like um, an attorney, right? An attorney who's defending you may not know if you're actually guilty or not. In fact, oftentimes they don't want to know. They just, their job is to come up with the best case against the other case. And so likewise, I think whoever is uh, going to take on the role of the devil's advocate has to make sure that they're doing it authentically. They're going to give it the best shot, even though they may ruffle feathers. And that's why the more people in the organization understand what devil's advocacy is, the less resistance they think you'll get because they know you're not trying to hurt them. They understand it's a beneficial thing to the organization. Yeah. And how can you measure the quality of your devil's advocacy? Because yeah, it's another I interesting one. You know, um, there's one slide. If we have a moment, there's a slide I'd answer that question. Now it's so coming up. Okay, so this is something that I refer to. This is the pyramid of scientific evidence. You see this in science. This particular one is used in medicine. And so uh, you'll see here the weakest evidence is at the bottom and the strongest is at the top. And so in medical trials, like the vaccines we're seeing, they need randomized controlled trials to make sure that what they're actually seeing, what they think they're seeing, they're actually seeing. And you'll notice at the very bottom of the quality of evidence is the expert opinion, which people sometimes shake their head about. But the reason this is so low is because it's just one person's opinion, no matter how skilled they are. The next one up are case reports where you can give an example of something happening. And then finally, there's ob observational studies. But the reason I have this slide queued up is that in this question about how effective is it or what's the proof, we oftentimes have very low level of proof sources for this. We can't, for example, run a project using one process and then go back and run it again using the recommendations that Devil's Advocate has made, right? It, it's really just a one and done. And so the, there's, it's very difficult to demonstrate that this particular analysis led to a better outcome or not, just like in poker. You know, you're making that decision at this time with the best information you have, you may still lose the hand. So again, it's not to try to come up with the best answer, it's try to, to make sure that the judgment you've made is based in sound evidence, the best you have, and it's thought through well enough. Okay. Um, another question that came up by Jan Willem, are there specific techniques such as abuse cases that you could use uh, for playing the role of devil's advocate? Well, uh, there are examples, again, I, I give in the book where uh, there have been devil's advocates kids in very high profile failures. For example, uh, Theranos, uh, you may know this company. This is the company that was going to do blood samples from the finger and everything would be done very quickly. And it turns out that that whole company collapsed because they, they could never come up with the technology. The woman's being sued. The company's worthless. It was worth $9 billion. But in the history of that company, there were people that said, look, this can't work. And here's why. And people that said, there's something wrong with the way that they're presenting this information and here's why. So there are examples where had um, the devil's advocates involved been listened to, you may have still ended up with a maybe not the best product in the world, but you probably wouldn't have had that failure that you had before. And so again, it's somewhat subjective because it's very difficult to prove unless you had gone back and actually taken advantage of those points. Uh, but common sense suggests that, you know, had this, I think I listed eight people in the book that challenged Theranos, had any of them to listen to and somebody took a close look, they probably would have avoided that problem. Okay. Um, and then maybe one last question before, because I hear that uh, Ravid is, Ravi is back uh, online. So, and then we can hear the end of his talk as well. Uh, a last question um, by Bert. Are people who are very new to the company typically good devil's advocates or just naive devil's advocates? <laughs> well, it's funny. I think social, as far as the social network of the company go, they must be naive. Uh, many years ago, I sold a business to a larger firm 
And uh, it was actually a former division of a company called Beckman. I don't even know if Beckman's around anymore. But one of the uh, VPs said to me at the time, look, I want you to tell us whatever you think right now before you become Beckmanized. And what he meant was at some point, you're going to adopt the culture here. You're going to understand the politics. And we, we want to talk to you before any of that happens. So, yeah, I think it's true that people coming into a company have a fresh vision. They may run into problems with the politics of the company. They don't know whose toes they might be stepping on and the like. And this is why, again, if the company already understands the benefits, they would be more gracious about any missteps that a new hire would make because they would understand there's a benefit in having fresh eyes tell us what they're seeing that we're probably not seeing because we're too close to it. Okay. Thank you very much.